a very uh, warm welcome to this third event in the Digital Visual Cultural Series. Uh, my name's Gillian Rose. Uh, I'm a Professor of Human Geography here at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm also a Fellow of St John's College. Um, both the Geography Department and the College are supporting uh, this event, so my, my thanks to them. Uh, and I also, a really big thanks to Sterling McKinnon, who's uh, uh, put lots of ideas into the event and also a lot of uh, hard work into the practical organisation. So thank you, thank you, Sterling. Uh, I just want to make a few introductory comments before handing over to uh, our lecturer this evening, Clancy Wilmot. Um, so Sterling and I are, are creating this series of events to explore the ways in which digital images of, of very many kinds are pervasive parts of our everyday experience, uh, certainly in many parts of the world. You know, there's now a huge range of digital visualising technologies which are mediating many of our everyday experiences, both intimate and public. And it's the effects of that ubiquity uh, of these digital uh, visuals uh, that's the focus of this series of events. Uh, we're hoping to plan something every six months or so. Please follow us on Twitter. That's the best way uh, to, to find out what's happening. Our, our handle is there. Um, and what we're interested in is the ways, is really the images themselves, but perhaps more uh, importantly, the kind of effects that these new or new forms of old ways of visualising the world uh, are having. So the first event was a, a great uh, kickoff. Um, uh, it, uh, we had uh, Professor Shannon Matten uh, talking about the very wide range of, of uh, surveillance technologies that are being deployed, particularly across the US-Mexico border. And you can catch up with her lecture on our, on our website. Uh, we filmed it, and, and, and it's up there. Um, and our second event, uh, last January, looked at the ways in which, uh, again, a, a wide range of digital visualising tech of, of different kinds a part of assembling various sorts of, of publics, urban publics. Uh, and Alice Watson and, and Adam Packer have created a, a series of podcasts from that two-day event. And again, they're, they're up on our website for uh, your uh, listening uh, delight. Um, so for this th third event, we, we decided to look at three-dimensional digital modelling. Uh, or at least uh, particular aspects of it. And it seems like we hit on quite a hot topic. Uh, there was an event just last week at Goldsmiths College in London uh, on a similar topic. Uh, and also, uh, there's actually a really extensive range of events across Oxford and, and beyond at the moment called Thinking 3D. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I would urge you to go uh, look, at, look at that. Uh, their website, again, is, is on uh, the slide there. Uh, they're looking mostly, they're art historians, um, uh, librarians leading that. They're mostly looking at histories of three-dimensional visualisations. Uh, but there's a lovely small exhibition in the Western Library right now looking at histories of anatomy, geometry, astronomy, um, architecture. Uh, at the ways that people tried to represent 3D things on, on a two-dimensional page uh, across a, a range of, of, of historical media. But perhaps it's not surprising that there's this interest in three-dimensional visuality at the moment, uh, because it seems to me, perhaps, that one of the most distinctive attributes of digital imagery is precisely its three-dimensionality and the ways in which it allows us to move, or apparently feel that we can move through uh, three dimensions. Uh, in 2013, the film critic Thomas Alsace suggested that the new default value of digital vision is precisely immersive. It's three-dimensional. These are spaces we feel we can enter into. Nana Verhoff argues that it invites navigation. Uh, and to quote Alsace again, this is a spatiality which does away with horizons, suspends vanishing points, seamlessly varies distance, unchains the camera and transports the observer. And I think, you know, in so many films, movies that you might go and see, computer games we play and so on, all assume this highly mobile, uh, uh, anchorless, uh, uh, um, visual, spatial, embodied experience. Uh, so there's a suggestion here that perhaps these kind of digital visualising technologies might be reconfiguring our contemporary visual culture in quite profound ways, away from a static image, you know, even a film is a collection of static images framed uh, uh, with a certain kind of uh, perspectival uh, structure into something that, that, that's perhaps rather, uh, rather different. So those are the kind of questions that we'll be exploring in the lecture uh, this evening and, and through the series of papers we have tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we have a range of speakers uh, looking at different kinds of three-dimensional visual modelling in a range of different professional practices. 
um, and thinking a lot about different, different kinds of objects that can be modelled uh, and the different kind of um, registers or effects through which modelling might take place, whether that's the idea of trying to create accurate replicas of objects as, as art forms, perhaps, uh, or, or as, as spectral kinds of, of imagery. Uh, but this evening, uh, we are kicking that off with, with a lecture, which I think will give us a great kind of framing perspective on this current diversity uh, of practice. We have a lecture and then a reception across, across the way. Uh, we're going to film the lecture. It will go up on our uh, digital visual culture web website. And I'm really uh, delighted that Clancy Wilmot accepted our invitation to give us this more extended uh, introduction to 3D visual models. I think she's going to say something about their histories, their dimensionalities, and perhaps also as a kind of emergent form or reformation of, of uh, visual culture, we might perhaps think about ways to reconfigure them. Clancy is uh, a vice principal postdoctoral research fellow at RMIT uh, in Australia. Uh, she has a forthcoming book, which I'm really, really looking forward to seeing. Uh, it's going to be called Mobile Mapping, Space Cartography and the Digital, coming out with the University of Amsterdam Press Open Access just gets better and better. Uh, Clancy's going to talk for 45, 50 minutes, I think. There'll be time for some questions, uh, and then we can continue the conversation more informally across the way at, at our reception. OK. Elegant. Radio. Thank you, Clancy. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Uh, so today I'm going to think through some ideas that I've been working on uh, for about the last 10 years as part of a series of inquiries around cartography and how histories and presence of mapping might interface or, or configure with the digital and digital uh, geographies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about point clouds, pixels and perspectives, um, and this idea of, of, the, of the map and of the cartographic and how that works in these new kinds of spaces and environments that we're seeing, so three-dimensional environments such as point clouds, etc. Uh, I'm going to start off by reading just a bit and then I'll stop after these two pages, I promise, but I want to get this bit right. <coughs> so, in Hong Kong in 1866, the crew of the survey vessel HMS Rifleman drove a copper bolt into the wall of the naval dockyard to determine mean sea level. The fixing of the chart datum was an intensely political affair. There were two tidal regimes that described low-level spring tides, that of Captain Belcher and that of Captain Moore, which were unattended by the Royal Hydrographic Office. And the temporary nature of the jetty where the copper bolt was driven into, uh, a flimsy wooden structure prone to rot and shifting with a seabed, drew concern over the suitability of using it as a permanent reference point for the datum. Geopolitics became entangled with the location of the bolt and the position of the location of the naval dockyard as the Royal Navy sought to cement itself in admiralty within the circle of influence of government of Hong Kong. By a number of counts, uh, including that of Davies and Munier, the vertical datum of the rifleman's bolt was a semi-arbitrary decision. Like latitude and longitude, a vertical zero point can be set according to what best suits the calculative apparatus of the institution or model being used. Yet the rifleman's bolt was set in the naval dockyard into the number 12 storehouse, as well as the outer end of the dockyard jetty. And the mean low level of spring tides established as 11 feet below the outer end of that dockyard jetty compared to the rifleman's bolt. During its tenure, the bolt was moved several times as a result of the relocation of the naval dockyard, which was HMS Tamar and the first round of land reclamations on the foreshore of what is now called Admiralty in Hong Kong. Eventually, the bolt re-emerged on the east wall of the accommodation in, in the Wellington Barracks, where it was fitted at the same height that was previously found at the old naval dockyard. However, an analysis of archival documents by Nate Davies suggests the datum established from the pier was perhaps more fixed in the imagination than in reality. Over the course of the 20 years after the bolt was fixed, it sank somewhat, becoming lower than it was previously. And then when it was moved with the dockyard after reclamations drew the north shore of the island further into the harbour, it was reaffixed again at a slightly different height. It was a survey datum for all heights and levels on land until 22 years later, when a 17 foot higher Hong Kong principal datum was established from tidal observations. The copper bolt, the, the rifleman's bolt, remained on site in the dockyard until a series of reclamations again changed the coastline of Hong Kong, and then it was moved to the new naval dockyard where it was once again driven into a wall however, at, again, a slightly different height. As the, hills, as the height of the hills in Hong Kong gave way to the heights of skyscrapers, a consistent and accurate measurement at sea level was really desperately needed. When the Hong Kong principal datum uh, was replaced in 1980 by the chart datum, the new sea level mean established via 19 years of tidal data was approximately 
four feet lower than the new chart datum. The arbitrary nature of this means that vertical measurement did not end with the rifleman's bolt. Um, so the Hong Kong principal datum was four feet lower than sea level, uh, which was measured over those 19 years. And that new sea level um, was established again in 1983. Um, the rifleman's bolt, which we can see here, uh, now sits in the Hong Kong Maritime Museum on loan from the Survey and Mapping Office. And it, I find it surprising how such a small object placed in an arbitrary place at an arbitrary height, an object no more than a few inches uh, in length, could so affect the determination and measurement of some of the tallest buildings in the world. Uh, indeed, uh, the um, uh, Hong Kong uh, poet and author talks about the fact that the buildings of Hong Kong are perhaps um, higher in our imagination than in reality because of these shifting datums. Um, and so with this bolt is imbued this sort of epistemological authority of an empire based on reason, but, you know, in which numbers are given a weight that belies their instability and such numbers build cities and, and do build Hong Kong. Um, and I'll talk about that later. And then in 2018, in Manchester, a geographer, me, uh, attempted to use the measurements of plans of the university laboratories, workshops and buildings to construct scale virtual reality models. These buildings, which house some of the earliest computing, software engineering and scientific innovations that have underpinned contemporary digital technologies, were experiments in both architecture and academia. The production of these virtual reality models, which involved cutting up the plans of buildings such as this Coupland One, and laying them as skins over underlying models um, built in architectural softwares before then being imported into game uh, design engines such as Unity uh, to facilitate interactivity. Yet, like the, uh, the rifleman's bolt, the prefab software or the prefab settings for the interactive model software Unity, uh, which I stole from the fringes of the open internet, did not move in the right ways and this geographer, me, wanting the viewer to be positioned not on the ground floor of this building but on the second floor, could not make the camera move up the requisite uh, 7 feet plus 1.72 metres for the average eye height of a person. Eventually, after hours and hours and hours of testing and trying different ways, um, it became clear that rather than moving the viewer up to the second floor, it was far, far easier just to move the entire building down. <coughs> so, I want to approach this question of uh, models, volumes, three-dimensional technologies from, uh, from a cartographic perspective. And I've specifically chosen this, even though there have been multiple different ways in which volume and three dimensions have been talked about in terms of territories, if we think about Stuart Eldon's work, uh, in terms of ecologies, um, if we look at the, the workshop um, that was held last week at uh, Goldsmiths. I want to return to a cartographic way of thinking. I think when we begin to think about the geographic politics of using three dimensional representations to enact and produce space, I think cartography gives us a really useful framework for thinking about and thinking through some of these politics. And specifically, I don't want to talk about cartography or cartographies as such, but a, a particular concept called cartographical reason, which has been enunciated by uh, Gunnar Olsen, Franco Farinelli and John Pickles. Uh, and this was a, an idea that really gained traction around the turn of the century and has been somewhat forgotten in the move towards data. But I think as an idea, it connects both what we might understand as um, the materiality of something with its representation. And Farinelli, when he talks about uh, cartographic reason, uh, he talks about uh, the first uh, map, as it's understood, which is an Anaximander's Pinax. And in this map, uh, what you see is, and, and how he describes it, is that the table, which uh, is a certain kind of surface, but becomes inscribed with information around geographic data, and then that image, that representation, is then used specifically to reason and to build. So it's not just an act of describing the world, it's not just an act of measuring and putting numbers in place, but actually that those, that abstraction then becomes the site of future decision making and future thinking about the world that almost supersedes uh, the material landscape, so to speak. And this way of thinking about cartography as cartographical reason, that is a rationality rather than just cartography itself, has really crucial ideological and discursive links to other ideas around the role that cartography has had in imperial and colonial processes throughout the world. And so we might think here about the cartographic impulse uh, that Edward Said talks about, that is the, the impulse to, to map in order to control, or cartographic anxiety, so what happens when our maps are revealed to be flawed uh, and, and 
non-transcendental um, or God tricks Donna Haraway. The cartographic eye is a way of looking and the cartographic imagination is a way of thinking. And what's uh, particularly uh, interesting about this idea of cartographical reason, a distinction that I personally make, is to separate out uh, cartographic reason as it emerges during the Enlightenment period. Um, and so when we think about cartographic reason, um, so that, again, Farinelli talks about logos and table coming together, so sign and the pinax um, are the same thing. And I think he makes a bold claim that uh, the protocol of geographical representation is that of the cartographic image, uh, but there is some truth, I think, to this claim. And so if we think about the Enlightenment period and we think about thinkers such as uh, uh, Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz or René Descartes, they had, I suppose, a belief in the underlying order of things, that the world was ordered in a particular way and we just needed to try and find a, a representational system that would best describe that order. So that underneath all of the, um, the chaos there was this the godly order, this transcendental beyond human that was ultimately knowable and expressible through usually mathematics but also philosophy uh, and other kinds and science etc. Uh, I think what's particularly important for thinking about cartographic reason is this is the time in which numbers and lines become connected. So the geometric or the sort of the geographic becomes connected to the geometric. And so in this one, for instance, we can see this is um, Leibniz's uh, Handschriften. So he's writing, this is some of the earliest forms of binaries that, that Leibniz uh, creates. And you can see here how he starts attributing lines to certain kind of number values. So if we think about binaries as 0, 1, on, off, and he takes these ideas from the I Ching mm. Um, so if you think about yin and yang, uh, black on white, etc. Uh, and so here, numbers are given certain kinds of lines. They're given their own kind of relationship. Uh, and similarly with uh, Descartes, you get algebraic geometry. And so this is when lines are given numbers. And so every point has two numbers that we can understand. Um, and then a series of points can be expressed as an equation. So you get this relationship between not just the uh, protocol of geographic representation as the cartographical image, but as a specifically numeric possibility that you can actually use this uh, to not just describe, not just measure, but then to project and think into futurity, whether that's an outward infinity or a really small infinity. Um, so, thinking about maps. Are we still with me? Yes? Okay. So, Maps have been charged by geographers as being very, very flat. Uh, they've been flat surfaces and that the flatness of the geographical imagination is because of the flatness of the cartographic image. Doreen Massey describes maps as a surface upon which we might skate or understand the world as this kind of flat surface. And I argue that this, when we, when we, think, about cart when we think about cartographical reason, uh, belies a, a certain misunderstanding about the role of maps. Maps imply a viewer. And so already in this implication of the viewer, you already get a sense of three-dimensionality. Uh, and we might understand this as scale. And so the x-axis is already established in early cartographic forms uh, through the use of scales, if you think 1 to 2,500, 1 to 25,000, etc. And if you look at the Google Maps on your phone, uh, you can see how that might go in and out. And if you look at the underlying code, you can see um, you'll get different z-axes at different points. And uh, as you zoom in, has, have you ever had a problem zooming in on, on um, Google Maps on your phone and you can't quite get the right scale because it jumps between one and the other? So what scale does is actually establish a striation in the same way that we think about longitude and latitude between you and the map itself. So already you get these striations in terms of how far away you can look and that's determined through the use of the, of the z-axis. So already the, the process of looking at a flat surface is already a volumetric negotiation, an intensely political negotiation as well. And if we look at uh, Alex Singleton's work, for instance, on Zoom and crime maps and the way in which certain crimes are represented at certain levels, Zoom is an incredibly political tool, uh, as is scale. Furthermore, moving beyond just the implication of a viewer, we already begin to see certain kinds of dimensionalities embedded in early uh, we might say cartographic, but scientific mapping that emerges post-enlightenment. Uh, and I would argue that these 
particular volumetric representations have a foundational relationship with processes of colonialism. And so these two maps are, are fairly early examples of mapping of Sydney. So on the right, you can see Botany Bay. So this is maps drawn by Captain Cook on his uh, Endeavour voyage in 1770. And in the sort of centre, I think you can see here, I'm going to move away from the light, sorry. Um, you can see here how there's all these numbers dotting certain parts of the inlet. And similarly here, this is a map 1788 um, by John Hunter of uh, Sydney Cove or sort of the, this sort of um, establishment of Sydney and it's a bit funny because north's down here but again you can see these numbers dotting into the surfaces and I think if you imagine yourself as someone who's been tasked with taking over someone's country and you're going to walk into that space and you're coming from the outside in then it's really really important you know where to put your boats you don't want your boats getting marooned on certain kinds of um, sandbars etc and I think interestingly here is that the shoals in Botany Bay were too shallow for the big boats that came later. So when the first fleet came in 1788, they found that their boats were much deeper than the, the Endeavour, and they ended up having to move northwards to uh, Sydney Cove. And so you can already begin to see how these kinds of ways of mapping these, these volumetric imaginaries form part of the, the colonial process as well. And to really drive the point home, this is 1843, um, a map of Hong Kong. And again, you can see the, the depth dotted all over it, as well as heart chewing of the interior of the map. And in order to be able to build spaces, one of the first things that happened during the colonial process was people sent out to survey into maps. So this is very early on. I mean, Cook didn't have any real designs on colon uh, colonising Australia, but the process of mapping becomes a way of creating this pinax, this, this static surface upon which you can make decisions. Similarly here, you can see the way in which the interior is largely untouched, uh, but the process of mapping becomes a central process, and this is very shortly after um, Britain gained Hong Kong. Um, and you can see here even more closely, this is by Lieutenant Con Collinson in 1845. Uh, he was um, a surveyor, and this is the emerging city of Victoria here, again with these numbers uh, showing the kinds of depths. And I, I want you just to briefly pay attention for later that these are not complete numbers, these are certain places, these are sounding depths put at certain sites. This is not a complete map in that Borgesian kind of tradition, it is partial, it is incomplete. We can generalise between places and the same if you see the contours up the mountain as well, so here. You can see these contours generalising about space and so just keep in mind these early kinds of generalisations and the way in which they formulate within cartography. Collinson also included a bunch of sketches with these maps of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a really interesting case study because it was so vertical. It's such a vertical space. There is very little flat land. And so if you're in the mid 19th century trying to build a city and you've been given the kinds of urban imaginaries that built Chicago and New York, these big flat plain grid patterns, and you're stuck with something that looks like that, it becomes very difficult to, to build. And so that's why um, they ended up building all those reclamations that left the rifleman's bolt moving out. Uh, and I think what's particularly interesting is that in the lack of flat land, flat land is made already in, 19, in 1845, you can begin to see um, here the tops of mountains being cut off and flattened in order to make ways for buildings. So you can begin to see these kinds of processes. We'll get to the digital soon, I promise. Um, and so what I'm trying to really hone in here is this relationship between the geographic, that is the drawing, and the geometric, that is a measurement. And that there is this relationship that is established during the Enlightenment that is taken up by cartography where there's an ongoing relationship between lines and numbers and they can be understood to be represented at the same time, that they give meaning to each other. We know how high something is and we can uh, draw a contour with a line, but in the same way we can measure a line down through a sounding depth um, and that that line can actually be given a certain length that then becomes a number in a map. So there's this beginning relationship. And so when we get into these dimensions, we begin to see the, the emergence of the z-axis, uh, as I said. And so just for those who are not geometrically inclined, this is what a three-dimensional uh, cube looks like with three coordinate points. So I showed you the x, y coordinate point earlier, but this is three coordinate points. So you can see the origin down on the bottom left, 0, 0, 0, 
Uh, and then you can see, you know, one zero zero, one one zero. And the reason that all of this talking about cartography is important is because then when you go into the very programs that are used to produce digital models, whether they're for planners, whether they're for healthcare, whether they're for artists, you begin to see these kinds of thinking utterly embedded at the base level of those programs. So this is a, a screenshot taken from Unity where you can already begin to see the positions here, X, Y, and Z. And so anytime you place something within these environments, you're being asked to draw upon this kind of thinking. You're being asked to buy into this geometric way of thinking. And you can also use programs and use the kinds of equations that Descartes created to shift and change those landscapes as well. So this kind of geographic, geometric way of thinking about space is utterly embedded in the model itself. So let's think about some of these little ways uh, that cartographic thinking might help us to understand some of the politics of these models. So, fixed points. And so, moving just beyond the theoretical of the geometric, um, part of the process of, of imperialism, as a quote from Farinelli was, um, was earlier, was the process of translating a series of previously incompatible ways of thinking or spheres into a single way of thinking. So this agreement, consensus about what, um, what language we're talking about what code we're using, about where we're measuring from. And so what you also see, as I sort of told you with the story of the Rifleman's Bolt, is the emergence of imperial fixed points. Uh, and so this Sydney Obelisk of Distances uh, was established as the starting point for all measurement in Sydney. So if you're travelling from Sydney to anywhere, this is the, this is the fixed point for Sydney. Uh, and Hilariously, Emma, I was talking to her in the car on the way down, and she quickly Googled what it is in Google Maps now, and it is no less than the American Embassy. That is the centre point of Sydney, uh, the MLC Centre, which is, houses the American Embassy. So you can see how this is already a political question. Uh, and similarly, for those of you who need a, a clearer example, the Greenwich Meridian. And so the Greenwich Meridian is still absolutely the fixed point that has been almost globally established as... Uh, the, long, uh, the longitudinal point from which we all measure. Uh, and when it gets crossed with the latitude, you get this incredibly important but utterly uh, nothing space, which is zero, zero on the map. And so this is zero, zero on Google Maps. Um, so this is probably the, the single most, this is the origin of all cartographic. Every time you use a TomTom, -tom, every time you use any kind of GPS, this is zero, zero. Um, and so we've got this cartographic fixed point on the X and Y axis. Um, and so what was really interesting is the kinds of politics that went into establishing places like the, the, the Greenwich Meridian. Sea level is a far different kind of beast because sea level is not a fixed point. Like longitude and latitude, it is utterly imaginary, but it's also much more difficult to measure, broadly speaking. And so Rady has an excellent paper, or a chapter in a book, where he describes the difficulties of establishing mean sea level with the Panama Canal. And they took averages on both sides, on the Atlantic side and the uh, Pacific side of the Panama Canal and established their average sea level. But the Pacific and the Atlantic actually have different sea levels. And they are working from different datums, which of course, if you're an engineer, makes real problems. And similarly, the Hong Kong datum was operating on its own for ages and ages and ages um, until it was brought into line with some of the more world datums, but even then they still had their own specific datum. Uh, and more contemporarily, there's a, a, a bunch of um, Latvian surveyors and, and engineers who are in the process of trying to transfer uh, their vertical datums out of the old Kronstadt system, which is a Soviet-era system uh, that the Russians still use, into the European system as well. And that's not just a pragmatic thing to be doing, it's intensely ideological and intensely political. It's about saying that Latvia is, is part of Europe now. So you get these kinds of politics about establishing this sea level. So where we, we establish our fixed points is, is quite political. Uh, and this is, I just wanted to show you, this is the Rifleman's Bolt. So this is um, a training manual given to surveyors from 2001 of all the different datums that they might encounter in the use of Hong Kong. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't want to be, ever be a surveyor in Hong Kong. And what is colloquially known as the world's most vertical city, so they have a lot of skyscrapers. They have a lot of call for measuring vertically and measuring volume. And, and this is not a very clean system for trying to establish that. And many of the buildings that were built that are now being regenerated or pulled down were actually measured during different periods uh, of these datums as well. So it can be quite messy uh, as well. Uh, and I mean, so this one is... Um, Oh, I haven't written when it's from. A fairly old reference to a date, and I think this is probably one of my um, favourite reference, like if we can talk about fixed points, if we can talk about origins, is here, um, Hong Kong, 19. Two below copper bolt on northwest corner of storehouse in Royal Navy Yard, corresponding to an exceptionally low spring tide. So it's so contingent. Fixed points are so contingent. Uh, and so I think they're political, but we also have a certain amount of agency about where we put them. What you get, I think, with three-dimensional technologies is a proliferation of the fixed points. The fixed point itself is no longer fixed. And so if we think about the driverless car driving along and how it knows where it's going, the driverless car becomes its own fixed point. So you get this pinging out, and that's up and down, and it's seeing all the objects around it as well as what's above it and um, often below it as well. So Roombas often work, you know, it knows to stop when there's a stair. So you get this this idea of the, f the fixed point being the car itself. And this is one of the, the amazing things about three-dimensional technologies, but you need to have multiple cameras in order to make that dimensionality. But I want to, uh, another example, though, is the way in which uh, sort of uh, point cloud cameras might move around an object as well. And so in that way, you know, that fixed point moves as well, but it's always pointing. And so you get this absolute relationality between fixed points and the way in which they work. You get this constant evolving kind of fixed point. But then, of course, when you bring it into the model, you still have an origin, you still have these fixed points as well. They haven't been lost. And so this is SketchUp. This is a, a popular program used by architects. And so you can see down in the bottom it says origin. Um, so that those lingering kinds of ideas still emerge within these, these uh, environments and, of course, what that origin is is always up for debate. But where we put that origin, and when we assume that origin to be apolitical, I think we begin to move into a, a dangerous territory of, uh, of assumption uh, without politics, without understanding the kinds of histories of, of these origins. Um, so those who are not familiar with digital models, you actually get a choice of model fixed points as well. So you have the object, which might be drawn in its own fixed point, but you can also choose a perspective. So remember when I was talking about uh, the z-axis as a kind of scale of looking, um, the map maker determines which way you look at a map. And so you might look at it from an orthogonal view, which is top down. But similarly, there's also one of my favourite views of maps is the equestrian view. So the view as you would view it if you were on a horse. And so there are these maps that are at equestrian views. Uh, similarly, you might get bird's eye views just in case you happen to be a bird. Uh, and want to imagine the space. So you get all these different kinds of views. What you get with three-dimensional technologies is actually the ability to choose where that viewpoint is. The coders get to choose where that viewpoint is. And that's intensely political as well. And I'll, I'll get to why that is. Um, and then you get the cartographic object, which has its own fixed points and its own geometries. And you even get to choose which way the light comes from. So you get to be in charge of the sun, which is an incredible amount of power that I think the Enlightenment philosophers would have been quite taken with, maybe. Uh, you know, that you actually get this completely so-called ordered space. And so this is an example in Unity of the sun. So you can see the sun has its own three-dimensional axes here, again, X, Y, Z. Similarly, up here, X, Y, Z, of course, you can turn it around so that the sky is in the air or the sky is underneath and the ground is up the top and there's actually no real absolute fixed point because it's only theoretical at this point. It's only a theoretical space. Uh, and there's the, the camera where you look from there. Um, again, the object and how that has its own three-dimensional, you've sort of seen the theme, lots and lots and lots of three-dimensional X, Y, Z axes. Uh, but of course, what, when you take these theoretical fixed points, much like the Morifelman's bolt, you begin to run into problems with the material landscape. And, and this is a, a story about some of the issues that's been happening in Australia with the introduction of driverless cars, where the fixed points are fine. They, they had a, a big problem where they couldn't quite figure out why some of the cars were stopping in different places and they were a bit off. 
And as it turns out that the coordinate system is fine, this imagined theoretical x, y, z axis is perfectly fine. The issue is, is that the Australian continent is actually shifting pretty quickly northwards. Uh, and so they have to recalibrate all the time. So even where you might have this imaginary fixed point, this imaginary cartography that exists on a computer or on a map, the landscape itself is still defying <laughs> this kind of stability, this idea that God has created or made objects in stable systems. Well, no one told the continent of Australia uh, because that is on its own journey northward towards Indonesia. And it's actually, it's about seven centimetres each year, which is not a small amount of... Of, of distance, um, particularly when we're not talking about just the theoretical difference between a car and a wall, but if we're also talking about the distance between a car and a person, a car and an object, uh, and we're talking about, you know, big trucks, mining trucks, etc. So we begin to see this certain kind of politics, this ideology surfaces. I'm watching the time. So beyond the fixed point, I want to just think a little bit more about the surface. And so I mentioned already that Doreen Massey describes maps as a surface, this idea of flatness. Uh, that maps have, but maybe three-dimensional objects don't. I want to think a little bit about the way in which the underlying ideology of maps actually do produce surfaces. And so that is hinged upon what I call generalisation. And so remember when I was pointing out all the little points that you couldn't map the entire surface of the ocean, you have to map at certain points? Well then, using often Pythagorean theorem, but include increasing like have a sign, different kinds of formulations, you can then generalise between those two points what you think happens. And so if you've got three points, you can sort of assume that people have travelled in a certain point. So if I'm here, and then you measure me here, and then you measure me here, you can assume that I've moved this way. Now, I could have moved like this between these three points, but you wouldn't know. You just assume. So you create this kind of generalisation between those points. Uh, so this is a, a classic example of how the contour line might work. So you measure at two points here and here, and then you draw the contour line. Now, you don't know necessarily that there's a smooth triangular surface like this between those points. It may, in fact, look much more like this. So you can see the two contour lines. Imagine this is an elevation. Uh, and also, then when they think about distance, well, I want to travel from here to here, you perceive it as being a kind of a flat incline. Uh, but when you actually get there, you realise that it's actually a lot more distance than you anticipated. Uh, and this isn't just the case for contour lines, it's also the case for like Google Maps. I mean, if you've ever been to a hilly city and you're looking at your map, you're like, oh, that's fine, that's totally walkable. And then you realise that you're at the bottom of a hill and it's actually a really tall hill. I mean, this is the problem with generalisation is that actually the, the nuance of what happens between those points tends to be lost. And, and in that nuance, a lot of things can happen. Uh, this is a point cloud uh, of a manuscript. Um, so even the line itself becomes, uh, like this is a flat surface and even the surface is not a surface, it still has to be generalised. And so I've, you can, it's side on here, but you can see how even the surface itself is not straight. It has to be brought into a kind of superficial uh, surface. And to show you really what I mean for those who are not particularly familiar, this is a terrain that I generated in Unity using a procedural generator. And so you can see how a drone may fly over a terrain or this is generated and you get this, this wonderful topographic surface here and you can see the top, but underneath it's actually just a void. It's just like a wrinkled manifold. It's a sheet. It's not actually got volume. It's not got depth. It's not got geology. Um, it's not even really got atmospheric. So you can kind of see the way in which this becomes a surface. Uh, similarly, um, this is a project by Pearson Brosen and Margaret Lukacs, and they've been really kind and let me use these images, so I'm just going to shout out to them. Uh, they did a, a point cloud mapping of um, trees in a heritage forest in the Netherlands, and this is um, a three-dimensional rendering that they've made that they have exhibited as a holograph, um, but it's also a virtual reality space that you can walk through, and it's also a video, so this is a kind of model. And you can see that, I mean, the integrity is incredible. Look at the detail on the left. Like, this is a properly um, detailed model. It looks almost real. Uh, but when you look at it a bit more closely, firstly, it's got a volumetric shape underneath. And so you get this sort of shape underneath over which you then have to lay a skin. So already you can see these generalisations. You can see the points 
that are being measured in the way in which the triangle itself is assuming a certain kind of nuance between those points. And then you overlay the skin on top of it. But what's really interesting, and I was talking to a person about this, is that underneath the model, it's a void. There's nothing there. It looks like it has volume. It looks like it's a thing. But actually, underneath it, and this is a shot from underneath, you can see how there's just a gap through here. There's just a, a, an absolute void. There's nothing in it. It's hollow. And so through this process of generalization, you create a surface which gives you an impression of what might be underneath, but actually holds nothing. So you get this kind of proliferation of surfaces. So even in the three dimensions, you're getting this surfacing that people have, uh, have accused maps of producing. So there's already these cartographic ways of thinking. I just want to point out, oh, I don't have it. I, I got rid of it. There's a nice little, you can almost see the edge of, a, of an alert there, which is um, person's not got enough data or not enough disk space to hold this particular model uh, because it is so uh, detailed in, in its rendering. And I think that's particularly important with the digital, which is in order to hold a lot of uh, point clouds, like a lot of points, you need a computer that can compute it. And so if you're thinking about efficiency, you want to manage as few points as possible. You want to try and create as few points from which you can generalise as possible. So there's always this question of data and how much memory and how much uh, RAM you might have in processing something. And so, you know, if you imagine yourself on a surface, uh, the map where there might be volume, the map flattens it. But equally so with the model, you can generalise a sphere from three circles. Uh, and so you can see three circles here. You can actually generalise between each of them to, to form a sphere. And similarly, uh, for a cube, you can generalise from, uh, from three squares to, to form a, a three-dimensional space. You actually don't need uh, to go into that much detail. And I think the question of detail there is also political. Um, and I think what also happens as well is back to this idea of the cartographic anxiety is eventually because we like to generalise, then the landscape itself becomes transformed into these ways of thinking, into the landscapes that are easy to be generalised. And so remember how I showed you the picture of Hong Kong with the, the top of the hill cut off? Well, if you go to Hong Kong now, you see a landscape that once looked like this, given contours, to give this sort of contoured shape, which of course eventually become flat surfaces upon which you can build. And so you see these kinds of striations, uh, which is not a true volume, but a series of surfaces becoming embedded in the landscape. And it's a similar point with, um, this is taken from Shannon Matten's The City is Not a Computer, from LIDAR. I mean, these are not the inside of the car. This is just what that LIDAR can hit. It just is a constant proliferation of surfaces from generalised points. You can see a palm tree, but it's just a series of points. You don't know what's inside the palm tree. So there is this kind of superficial uh, issue. And then, of course, here, this is Hong Kong itself. So you can see how the landscape itself actually becomes striated according to these cubic kinds of structures. Uh, and so why is the politics of generalisation important? And why is it important to sort of to think a little bit more about what happens between those points, between the gaps? Kangaroos. Uh, Australia, once again, is nature's uh, delimiter, um, its resistor. And so when Volvo was trying to, um, it was mapping the path of certain kinds of objects, particularly animals, uh, in the use of its driverless cars. And so it would base it mo like moose and elk and reindeer, these big lumbering animals that move here. And so you sort of send out a lighter signal, it's there. You send out another one, it's there. That's there. You can kind of predict where that elk is moving. You get a sense of it. And I think uh, I was talking earlier, uh, again with Emma, about the Australian also having this imaginary of the, the deserted landscape. There's nothing really there. It's a, often a test bed for these kinds of innovations because it is imagined as empty. It is this space that is very much able to be laboratorised into this kind of test bed. Uh, and so Volvo, with their Nordic imagination, comes to the test bed of Australia and immediately stumbles upon our friend the kangaroo, who does not move according to the way in which point cloud logic should work. It does not stay there and then move there and then move there. And there's a lot of accidents involving kangaroos in Australia because a kangaroo will jump. It will be there and then it'll be closer, then it'll be further, and it jumps in this kind of zigzaggy pattern. It's incredibly unpredictable because of the way its legs move. It can actually 
bounce in really peculiar ways. Uh, and so <laughs> when Volvo comes to show, they have these massive problems with kangaroos and they have to actually set up um, a, a, a whole <laughs> sort of um, sub section of their company to test for kangaroos in Australia. And so this is on the, on the right here, a kangaroo detection data collection vehicle um, that has been testing how the hell do you map a kangaroo's movement is not point cloud, it cannot be generalised. These are very strange animals and it's kind of solved the problem. But I think the kangaroo as it serves as a really useful reminder about when we imagine dimensional spaces as these surfaces or that you can generalise between these volumetric points that actually we are quite limited in terms of the, this stable system that we think we're mapping is incredibly limited uh, and, and very much centred upon certain fixed points and that we might see as not just origins but also cultural, social, political and economic fixed points. And so, of course, uh, the LIDAR, I was in, um, in the, the Bay Area recently and it was strange, it was like living in the, in the environment that Google imagined it would be used in. Uh, and so the streets of Palo Alto are very different to say the streets of Oxford. Um, if you can imagine autonomous cars mapping those streets, cyclists, etc., you can sort of begin to imagine. And these is going from, from one Western country to another. We're not talking about slums here, we're not talking about informal settlements, we're still talking about very much built up kinds of spaces, um, formalised spaces. So I want to just end. Um, looking, sort of bring it together in a project that I've been working on, the one that I spoke about at the beginning, about using um, plans of the University of Manchester to produce virtual reality spaces. And much of the kind of critique that I've been building throughout this talk has, has actually emerged from the practice of using these uh, dimensional technologies. Uh, and I want to return back, I've, I've, Mayor Culpa, I have cited a lot of men uh, particularly white men in this presentation uh, and partly that's to do with the, the history of cartographic thinking, critical cartography um, and so I want to try and reinvigorate a bit of feminist techno science and feminist geography back into this space and, and be quite open and political about that and I think working through this uh, VR installation that I've been building has actually really hit home a lot of the questions that Donna Haraway was raising way back in 1988 way back in like 1997 when she wrote Modest Witness, The Second Millennium, uh, and, and more contemporary work as well by Luciana Parisi, uh, Anna Munster, etc. And as, as well, not just talking about space theoretically, but actually as a material, lived, experienced thing that happens as a co-forming kind of space in the way that, that Doreen Massey talks about space, not just a Cartesian territorial way that someone like Stuart Eldon talks about, but actually as this intensely political, contested, but open and vibrant way of thinking about space as well. I think for me, the kangaroos and the continent of Australia very much fit into that, that massive category, not the Cartesian category at all. And so this is Kuplan One. So this is the building that was built for Alan Turing uh, in 19, sort of circa 1948 when he came to the University of Manchester. And it was designed, purpose built to house the Ferranti Mark I uh, computer. And no one had really built a laboratory for computing before, so they weren't really sure how to go about it. So it's this really peculiar, quirky building uh, that's uh, found along Coupland Street uh, at the University of Manchester. Uh, and you can actually see specifically Turing's corner. His office is here, Mr. Turing. And I'm just going to point out now this other unknown element called typist. You know, who typist is, uh, this kind of, you know, question. And on the ground floor, there's a, a machinery room which just says, um, you know, machinery, magnetic, etc. So it's just, they don't really know what they're doing. And I had a lot of fun cutting up this plan and actually using the measurements of this geography with this geometry together to try and build a scale model using the architectural uh, um, measurements put into this. And it, it kind of worked, but it kind of didn't. Um, and so firstly what I realised is in the process of building skins, is this going to work? Ooh. Um, that you basically... Come on. There we go. So this space that we inhabit is actually, in a way, its own exclosure. So it's, it's an object. This building is actually an object without reference point. You don't see it within the environment. It just is utterly contained. There are lots of gaps in the plan where they just assume you kind of know what's going there. So I had to create 
these extra kinds of skins. And what I did was actually just create a shape over which I put these uh, maps as, as skins. And so you can kind of see how it is this dimensional object that has fixed points, it has its own kind of origin. Uh, but it's also completely relational. I mean, it has no gravity. I mean, you cannot do this with the real Kuplan one building, I guarantee you. I mean, you can go and try, but I'm not sure <laughs> that this is ever going to work. So you get this sense of the object as being disembodied. It's a, it's a conceptual object. It's disembodied from its, from its space and its place. And then what you do is you put it into an environment that allows you to, to establish a perspective. And this is where things get really interesting. So first of all, you've got this question of, well, I'm building this thing, but it's, it's not got materiality. Uh, actually, if you look here, uh, the walls actually don't have width. Uh, so the walls in the building itself don't have the same kind of width. And I was too lazy to actually do the kind of establishment for the wall. So you can see here, this is the wall here, but it doesn't actually have, this is, it doesn't actually have width of that wall. So I mean, it's a conceptual object. It's not a theoretical, it's a theoretical object. It's not a material object um, in and of itself. And then when you put it into this space and you get questions of situated knowledges and perspectives, so this incompleteness then bleeds into this, well, who's looking and how are we looking? Uh, and so you can kind of move between the two. Is this video going to work? Ooh. Hmm. Oh, video. We'll just leave it there for a moment. But you can see how this shape then becomes, oh, here we go. So you can actually move through walls. So this theoretical object, this volume, has no actual material surface. And so, again, you can move it around. You can kind of see it as an enclosure uh, that's inside. I've set the light as being inside, so there's no light on the inside. You can do the same kind of things uh, that you can do with the, the model, but actually you get this question of both the enclosure and the exclosure, the figuration of how these are figured. And so when you go in, you move from understanding this objective model into this situated model as well. And so when we think about VR, and when I was actually writing the scripts for VR, they told me to put the... Uh, I, was, I was sort of Googling what's the best height, and they're like 1.72 metres, which is the average eye height of a person. And I don't know what kind of person they're talking about, um, but it's, it, was, it was not a political contention at all. It wasn't something that was thought about. It was just 1.72 metres. And I thought, well, I'm not sure that I want to put 1.72 metres because for me, this is situating this, this building that has a very specific kind of history that births the kinds of spaces that I'm actually building here uh, that has a political history um, in which, uh, quite interestingly, you know, Mr Turing becomes a figure uh, who is... Uh, I would say brutalised um, because of his sexuality, but also this mysterious typist who gets no name, uh, who is probably a woman, whose job eventually became obsolete because the whole point of the Ferranti Mark I <coughs> and Turing's work was to actually make typing obsolete. Uh, and if we think about Judy Wakeman's work around sort of clerical work and that becoming um, obsolete through autonomy, uh, this is not the runtime, this is the... Uh, just the internal model. And so I decided to, you know, where do you situate the viewpoint? Where do you situate the fixed point? Do we start with Turing? Do we start with the machine? Do we start with the typist? Do we start within the walls? And similarly, at what height, what is the gaze that we might choose here? Do we choose the height 1.72 metres, which one can only assume is the average height of everyone who works at Unity? And I'm not, I'm gonna, not gonna make generalisations here, but I think you can assume what I'm trying to say here. Or, or do we make it my height, 1.68 metres, or do we make it the height of someone in a wheelchair? Like, what height do we choose? And so there, there were all these political questions in terms of establishing these fixed points. How do we encounter the surface? Do we move through the surface? Do we create it as a boundary as well? So there's these kinds of possibilities here that I just wanted to, to highlight uh, as part of it. And so you, so you can kind of see how all of this, if we go back all the way, all the way back to Hong Kong and the Rifleman's Bolt and dropping sounding depths to try and understand uh, depth and, and how deep the ocean is, you can sort of see where these fixed points are coming from colonial boats, etc. And I think what we get here is a chance that fixed points have somewhat been relinquished, uh, but we also need to ask ourselves political questions about, well, where do we reset them? You know, whose gaze <coughs> and whose models and whose surfaces uh, and, and what are the limitations of that, but what also what are the possibilities? And, and being humble in the face of these kinds of technologies. And there's a, a strange irony 
here where when you put it into VR for the, for the phone, it becomes flat again. <laughs> it's once again a surface. It's returned to its cartographic origins where it's just a screen. Uh, and so it's again a conceptual dimensionality. It's not, it's not a real dimensionality. And so to end, I'm just going to end with a quote from Donna Haraway, um, which is taken from a Modest Witness at Second Millennium. I'm not going to keep trying to remember the entire title of the book because there's a lot of female man and onco mouse and trademarks and copyrights. But she says, I'm not arguing for complacency when I list the narrative set up of threats and promises. So this is of technology. Only for taking it taking seriously that no one exists in a culture of no culture, that is, there is no theoretical kind of culture, um, it's always situated, including the critics and the prophets, critics such as me and prophets such as we might find in Silicon Valley, as well as the technicians, so those who actually make these models as well. We might profitably learn to doubt our fears and certainties of disasters as much as of our dreams of progress. So we can, we can doubt all things and this is a profitable endeavour. We might learn to live without the bracing discourses of salvation history, we exist in a sea of powerful stories. They're the condition of finite rationality. So we might think here about the finity of cartographic reason, that there is a finite rationality. Uh, and personal and collective life histories. Changing the stories in both material and semiotic senses, so both topos and logos, uh, is a modest intervention worth making. Thank you.